Welcome to On Texas Football. It's time for this week's State of the Program, brought to you by Adam Lowy, the Lowy Law Firm. I'm Bobby Burton, joined by Jerry Hamilton and C.J. Vogel, both of On Texas Football. Uh, guys, uh, on tap for today's State of the wo- Program, or this week's State of the Program, we're going to talk stars of the fall camp, guys that are uh, stepping up uh, that we need to talk about, as well as some surprises in that list. Uh, we're going to talk a little recruiting action. Uh, Texas currently sitting at 16 verbal commitments on the campaign. Some people wondering what that really means for Texas. Is it where they need to be? Are they ahead or behind schedule? Uh, Jerry and CJ will give you uh, their thoughts on that. I'll chime in as well. And then finally, we're going to talk a little bit about Colorado State. Have some numbers that are quite interesting there. But let's start, guys, with fall camp. I don't think there's any question, and uh, we talked about this beforehand, Silas Bolden has been a shot in the arm to Texas this fall camp. He came in strong, and he is finishing strong. Not what you expected from a 165, 160-pound ball of uh, uh, of a player in this. I, I just I feel like people are underestimating what he is bringing to the roster right now, just straight from not just a playmaking ability, but all through the whole roster. His um, verve for the game is kind of permeating right now is what I'm hearing from behind the scenes. CJ, I'll let you start. Yeah, I think the best way that you can describe Silas Bolden is both, one, with energy, and two, there's electricity there, right, in the sense of when he has the ball in his hands, Bobby, uh, good things tend to happen. And we got to hear from Manny Muhammad on, on Tuesday afternoon about what that just means for the team. And he said, well, when he's got the ball, you better not miss him because he's going to be gone. And I think that's the exact, you know, kind of uh, yards after catchability that Texas has been wanting under Steve Sarkeesian. They had it last year with Xavier Worthy and the year before that, obviously. Now you're going to see that, I think, a little bit more uh, throughout the entire uh, entirety of that wide receiving room going into 2024. But with Silas Bolden, it's a lot of energy and a lot of electricity. Again, uh, you look back at some of the stories that Quinn was able to share about the scrimmage in the sense that he's the one jumping up and down after touchdowns, even when it's not him scoring. He's the one that's energizing the sidelines, being that kind of ball of fun for that room as well. Of course, he's making some big-time plays on the, the scrimmage field too, Bobby. But, uh, man, when you look at what he can provide in terms of creativity and playmaking ability, that's a guy that's going to see the field all the time for the Longhorns this upcoming fall. I kind of I kind of linked him to Serge Abari Rice this morning on Coffee and Football. And, 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 I, and I say that because – Look, they both, neither guy was highly recruited, yet they've now elevated themselves. Now, Silas Bolden didn't go to a Power 5 school, Oregon State. That was his only Power 5 offer. But 5'8", 155-pound kid coming out of high school, overlooked. Serge Jabari Rice was 6'3", 140. I mean, overlooked coming out of high school, right? He had one offer. But all those things they bring, they impact winning, whether they have the ball in their hand or not. They can come off the bench or start. Doesn't matter when you have that mindset um, and that type of leadership, and maybe not in a quarterback leadership, but in a different way type of leadership and that infectious uh, attitude they have. And then there's the big component they're fearless. That's the one thing I'll say. They're fearless in moments, they're fearless in matchups, they're fearless in practice, they're fearless in a game setting. And the first open practice that we had that we watched this year, uh, guys, we saw that Silas Bolden was a fearless guy right out of the gate. We saw that early on, or at least I did, covering Texas basketball, Serge Abari Rice. To me, a lot of similarities between those two guys. And the other thing with the with what the Texas fans saw with Serge Abari Rice, that they're going to see with Silas Bolden, they want the ball in the big situations. That's that fearlessness, that good chip on your shoulder, that want to always prove something, chip on your shoulder. I think there's a lot of similarities between those two while they're different players in different sports. Jerry, one guy that we're going to mention here as uh, having a good fall camp uh, is one that needed to step up, and this is one that you want to talk about from behind the scenes that you've heard is doing real well, and he needed to because he's a new starter this year, and that's Cam Williams, a young man out of Duncanville, apparently having a really, really good fall camp. Uh, Tell people what you're hearing there. Yeah, so what's interesting about Cam Williams is headed into the season after the spring, 
there was a thought that, oh, this guy could be a first, second round type draft pick. That's not us talking. That's in Austin. Um, and I think the fall camp is kind of – and before started before the fall camp, losing about 15, 20 pounds. He's in the best shape he's been in. This is his, year, this is his first year starting. Obviously, that's a little extra motivation. Uh, he's had a really good fall camp. And the, uh, the expectation right now is that he's going to have a really good season and, it, you know, be forced to have a decision to make, which could be an easy decision. If he if it translates from practice field to the game field on Saturdays, he's going to be the Byron Murphy on this team this year that wasn't on the draft boards at the start of the year, really, that flies up to be a first or second round level player. I think that's where Cam Williams is headed if the fall practice carries over to the games on Saturday. And now Byron had a little bit more production, obviously, and he played more um, than Cam Williams, but he was not thought of as a first, second round level NFL draft pick at this time a year ago. And then he really vaulted himself into that on the field. I think Cam Williams has a chance to do similar things. CJ, another guy uh, that you've heard uh, has been doing really well. And even in front of the mic, Manny Muhammad talked about him, but myself, you, as well as Jerry has, have also heard that Gavin Holmes, uh, the cornerback out of uh, New Orleans uh, via Wake Forest, has been making his mark and making it a tough decision not to just put Jod A. Barron over at cornerback and play J uh, Jalen Gilbo at nickel. J uh, Gavin Holmes apparently coming on pretty strong the second half of this fall camp. Yeah, another guy, as Jerry mentioned, has turned some heads, you know, behind the scenes in camp so far has been Gavin Holmes. And we got to hear again from Manny Muhammad yesterday in terms of what he's meant and that kind of leap that he's taken from the spring into the fall says it's been tremendous. And if that's the case, well, I know it was a big question mark who was going to be that second cornerback opposite of Manny Muhammad. If that can be figured out early in the season and that guy play very well, which has been the case so far for, for Gavin Holmes, you might be looking at a, a secondary without a flaw right now. And I know that we have to go watch it. We have to see it. But on paper, you're going to feel very confident about what you can do as a play caller, as a schemer, as someone that can move around a lot of versatile pieces. Right now, it sounds like this is the best version of Gavin Holmes Texas has seen since he arrived from Wake Forest. And of course, going into the SEC and a matchup opposite of Manny Muhammad. And we've heard Rod Babers talk about this. When you have a number one guy and teams see that and they know that coming into the game, well, who's going to be tested? It's going to be the opposite side of the field. So he's going to be testing Gavin Holmes. That alleviates a lot of the concern about the big play abilities let up that Texas was uh, susceptible to in 2023. That would be a, a, a big bonus going into this season. And right now, it's trending that direction. That's good stuff because I think they're going to need more depth in the secondary. Manny Muhammad is one of those guys that is a smart cornerback, has a high football IQ. He's not necessarily the downfield cornerback you want running with a guy that runs 4-4. That's that's the, the category there. All right, I want to say thank you to our sponsor uh, before we get talking about recruiting here. Uh, Adam Lowy and the Lowy Law Firm have been helping injured Texans for more than two decades. If you've been injured in a car wreck, truck wreck, automobile accident of any kind, including an ATV or uh, 18-wheeler, give Adam and his firm a call at LowyLawFirm.com. Reach out to them. They'll give you a free, no strings attached consultation at LoweyLawFirm.com. All right, guys, Texas now at 16 commitments this week. Uh, they lost Cade Phillips over the weekend. That was a big loss at safety. And Jerry, uh, talking recruiting with you, uh, there are five or six guys making their decisions up in the next two weeks. Uh, it starts later today with Michael Fasusi. Uh, then we also are going to see uh, the big offensive lineman out of Louisville. Then we're also going to see Nick Brooks, the big offensive lineman out of Georgia, uh, that's going to announce. Uh, we have uh, Jonah Williams, uh, maybe the state slash nation's top safety out of Galveston Ball, Aiden Anding out of Ruston, Louisiana. Uh, beyond that, we have Jamie French, wide receiver out of Jacksonville Mandarin. If you're to put an over-under <laughs> on how many Texas is going to get out of that group right now, what is that number for you, uh, in in your opinion, and where would you where would you be? I think Texas is in a good spot for three of those guys as of Wednesday morning. Um, now they have to go announce. Uh, obviously, Fasusi we think goes to Oklahoma this afternoon, or later this afternoon. Nick Brooks been trending Texas. 
I'm not sure unless I hear something different from the Georgia side. I talked to somebody last night that was still thinking Texas there unless I hear something from the Georgia side that changes my mind or some flyer from the USC side. Uh, I think Texas is trending there. Um, then you get the Jonah Williams, Texas or LSU. Um, again, I'm going to say the same thing I have, and maybe he's the trailblazer or the first, but everybody in that family stayed in state for college. Um, so we'll see there on Saturday. But we've been hearing, all of us have been hearing more positive stuff with Texas in the last 72 hours there, the football-baseball combination. Texas going to the playoff um, last year. Texas, Texas A&M, neither have a safety in this class. Um, and, and by the way, there's some other things we'll talk about after this Jonah Williams decision if it goes Texas way. Um, and then you look at um, Aiden Anning. I think that's going to be LSU. I think there's some push up in the Ruston area for LSU. There, Arkansas has done a great job recruiting them. Texas has done the best job they can. Uh, but it really feels like there's some late push it, it, around his circle um, for LSU there. So we'll see what Aiden Anning does on Saturday. And then Jamie French on the 30th. Te I, I still think Texas is trending over Miami. Miami ma is making Texas earn it, as they should. If they're not, they're not doing their job in the state of Florida. Uh, but I, Texas has the best relationship with Jamie and his family, and that's been a constant here since that visit in April when Texas really ascended in that recruitment. Nothing – I've heard nothing to push me off of that. Uh, again, we're nine days out from Jamie French's uh, uh, decision. If something were to change there, I think we'd start to hear about it this weekend uh, if there was going to be some change in French's recruitment. So far, we have not. Still looks pretty good for Texas. So three uh – yeah, th those those are those are three great players. I mean, let's say uh, those are three. That would push Texas to a top players. seven or eight class in the country, guys. That would push them in the top ten firmly if they got all three of those guys. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's that's what I'm getting at. If you if you look at it from a broad perspective, that would then put Texas at 19, right? Um, and all of a sudden they're at 19 before the season is even underway. In the high school, in high school or college football, that's better than they were a year ago at this time. Yeah, and then you have Michael, and you have Michael Terry out there, who's a Texas trend. Over CJ went down there last week. We have the, I think we have the same exact information on that. Uh, hopefully, that's that'd be bad if we don't. Um, I think Texas is trending over Nebraska and Oregon for Michael Terry. Um, so we, he could decide in September, October. Man, frame I think still Notre Dame, but that's before a flip. That's before uh, the, any of the new offers. I mean, there's three new D-line offers in Georgia. I think two that will be a factor before those guys visit. Um, and so this class, if they get those three guys, the if game, it, they're sitting right there to have fourth straight top five class. Now, you still have to fill all your needs, but for the winding turn this class has taken, maybe with the expectations after the playoff run, it's been a little bit more of a winding turn in that class through the summer. Sark's still in position for a fourth straight top five class if they win Friday and Saturday. Yeah, I think so as well, especially when you look at the bodies and the, the caliber of bodies that are still available. Jerry, you mentioned three really talented guys that Texas is in good spots for, plus Michael Terry. Those late class flips that we've seen Texas come in and swoop in for late, they're still on the table, right? You know, whether it be uh, a guy out of North Shore that Texas could circle back for and make a late run for. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it's always a possibility with Steve Sarkeesian. Right around this time is when, well, maybe not even, right? It took deep into October, I believe, for Texas to really start getting the, the ball moving with Xavier Phil Simi last year. Uh, also worth mentioning Jackson Blackwell, the defensive lineman out of uh, Lorena, currently committed to Baylor, will be on campus for the Colorado State game as well. OTF got that confirmed last night. So, those late pieces, if Texas is able to get to 19 ahead of the season or right around week one, you have plenty of room to work with in that class to fill out and go specifically target your needs and get to where you want to be. And that's the top five classes Jerry was talking about. It, it, I'll say this. If Texas is having a good season, which probably means a win over Michigan um, or a one-loss season, it, whether, it made, whether that's Texas or Oklahoma, whether it's Michigan or Oklahoma, um, when Georgia comes to town, that that's going to be a chance to impress a lot of players. And some of those guys in that mid-October will be guys committed elsewhere. They'll want to be at the Georgia-Texas game if it's all it's hyped up to be at that time. I, I, I just think that, look, there's it's no time to panic or overreact. These, these three that y'all are talking about, though, uh, whether it's Nick Brooks, Jonah Williams, or Jamie French, 
my point my point on this is this these are elite players okay it does you know texas is going to have 19 guys that are essentially i think what 17 of them are national level recruits that is plenty they need to fill it out the class but it's they're not this is not a, a time to panic in any stretch by any stretch in my opinion they need to keep closing on guys they need to flip a, a defensive lineman or find a defensive lineman that they like. I, we agree with that. They need to find more DBs now. But if they get to 19 prior to the start of football season, they can close that gap, right? Yeah. They can start focusing on those positions as opposed to being all over the place, uh, really, and uh, try to be a little bit more judicious with the uh, numbers and who they're uh, after, et cetera. All right, a um, couple other things we want to talk about today. Uh, last one actually is about Colorado State. Uh, CJ and Jerry, I, I thought this was interesting. Texas started off uh, 35 and a half point favorites over the Rams. That number is now down to 33 and a half. Uh, that's not a huge move, but it is significant. A lot of people think in Texas uh, may not cover at that 30 half, 35 and a half point level. That is a lot of points. And I know it's early, but Colorado State had a decent offense a year ago. So if Texas is going to have to cover by 33 and a half, they're going to have to score in the high 40s, maybe in the 50s. Well, that, that's kind of my thought on that. Yeah, but if you look at Colorado State last year, they gave up 50 to Washington State, uh, to double overtime, 43 to Colorado, um, 44 and a 20-point loss to Utah State on the road. They lost at UNLV. This is They struggled on the road last year. They lost at Hawaii last year at Wyoming by nine, which playing Wyoming, that's like losing by 30 to somebody else. So they really struggled on the road. And in their power five game uh, against a really good offensive opponent, in Washington State, they got blitzed. So, and the quarterback was a freshman from Alito through a bunch of interceptions last year. Is he better with the football this year? That's going to be the key for Colorado State against Texas. If he has a two or three interception game, they're going to get blown out. I mean, they got to play very clean game in Austin, but the, the, I actually like Texas to cover that number as crazy as this. Ooh. I'm really out there on a limb. I'm not a better, but because it's going to be 190,000 degrees, shoes are going to be melting in the stands and on the field. Colorado State is not accustomed to that. If they turn the ball over at all, they're going to get blitzed. I like that. I also like the over in this game. And I say that because this is a, a Colorado State team that throws the football a lot. We know Torrey Horton is a tremendous wide receiver. Uh, Braden uh, Fowler Nicolosi actually was 16th in the country in passing yards per game or oh, total yards a year ago as well. I know he had a lot of interceptions, but, you know, when you're down against a lot of teams, Jerry, you got to come back in some way. And Texas secondary will be tested. I do think that pass rush will have success as well. With that said, there is some movement, obviously, on Colorado side of the, the the line here, right? That line to be steamed down two points to 33 and a half. I think in large part is because of those final four games Colorado State played a year ago. Uh, starting Laramie, they went up to Wyoming, only scored 15, but they held their final four teams, starting with Wyoming, under 28 points. Why am I saying I like the over? Well, we got to go against the trends here, and to Jerry's point, it's going to be really hot. And by the uh, end of that third quarter, going into the fourth, you're not going to want to. You're not going to see many Colorado State players uh, want to continue running on that field as hot as it is, standing in the sun on that sideline as often as you see opponents do in Austin. But final four games, real quick. Lost to Wyoming, 24 to 15. They beat San Diego State, was a pretty solid team a year ago, 22 to 19. Beat Nevada, 30 to 20, and then they lost on the island to Hawaii, 27 to 24. So they were closing the gap of where they were at the end of the year. I think some. You know, some of those big whales, those those big gambling folks are sensing some of that momentum from the end of the year. Of course, returning their star wide receiver, returning the quarterback. We've talked about that with Quinn. That matters. It's going to matter again for Jay Norvell and their offense. I like the over and I like Colorado State to cover. By the way, by the way, I'm not saying this because I want to be right on Texas uh, covering the 33 and a half. Coach Sark, 100,000 fans aren't sitting in DKR to watch Arch Manning hand it off. Put it on, put the ball in the air, baby. Score the late one. <laughs> Score the late one. Uh, that's good, Jerry. I, I look. I, my take on this game is uh, is a little bit different um, in that I just think it's a first game, um, and all of all kinds of 
crazy stuff happens with turnovers in first games. You don't know other teams' tendencies yet. So a team can get on top of you early, vice versa. I think I think being and playing in DKR, to y'all's point, will matter uh, because the heat will matter. I mean, Fort Collins is not Austin, Texas, uh, either from an elevation standpoint or uh, from a heat standpoint. So it is a little bit different uh, there. We'll see how much that matters. I think that uh, Colorado State is going to have, have some problems in DKR when it comes time. And I agree with Jerry. Uh, I want to see Arch Manning get some time. But first and foremost, I want to see Texas's pass rush in that game. And I want to see exactly what Quinn Ewers and who Quinn Ewers connects with in the passing game. That That's going to be the start of what we think we might see up in Michigan in Ann Arbor a week later. Uh, that's where that's at. All right, uh, that's going to do it for this afternoon's episode of State of the Program. Thanks again to our friend Adam Lowy of the Lowy Law Firm. If you've been injured in a car wreck, truck wreck, automobile accident of any kind, give Adam and his firm a shout. LowyLawFirm.com, free consultation uh, to check out if you might be due any compensation. Again, LowyLawFirm.com, 20 years of experience in and around Austin and the state of Texas. All right, uh, that'll do it, guys. Any final comments uh, from you, Jerry, or CJ before we let folks go with this state of the program? No, I mean, look, it's football season. We're talking football. SEC basketball schedule came out for the Texas men yesterday. It's a doozy. Um, I, I, put, I wrote something on ontexasfootball.com about that. The football team, pretty good. First-year SEC schedule, basketball, six coaches have been the final fours, a number of uh, mock first-rounders. Um, and 12 games in the top against top 40 ranked teams. That's just in conference play. It's a hell of a tough schedule for Rodney Terry and your one in the SEC. Oof. Oof. <laughs> yeah. See, CJ did not like that. All right. Hey, right. at least the Moody will be rocking a couple times. Yes. All right. Uh, guys, that'll do it for this week's uh, State of the Program. For Jerry Hamilton and CJ Vogel, I'm Bobby Burton. We'll see you next time. Hook up. <laughs>